Part three, chapters nineteen and twenty of the Mysteries of Marseille by Emile Zola. Translated by Ernest Alfred Bizzatelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter nineteen. In which Matthias at last gets Joseph in his arms. Sauvert had lost sight of Monsieur de Casalis on entering the stronghold, and was furious at not being able to discover where he could have got to, after having had the trouble of watching him for nearly an hour under a doorway the worthy man continued to ignore his rank of captain he had one fixed idea that of coming to the assistance of the brother of his friend marius he turned about on the square anxious and embarrassed when it all at once occurred to him that philippe must be hidden in vine's old abode he looked at the house and caught sight of the head of m de girousse hey i say you up there he shouted to the old count come down quick and open the door m de girousse who was extremely anxious about philippe decided to go down knowing that the two brothers had taken refuge in the house opposite and hoping to be of some help to them but when he was once below in the corridor he found himself in the presence of the rioters who had fastened the bolts and would not allow him to go out he succeeded however with some trouble in making them set the door ajar and after pushing him out they again closed it sauvert and m de girousse found themselves face to face hey the deuce exclaimed the ex-master stevedore you should have left the door open i am going to have you arrested the nobleman examined the captain with curiosity you are going to have me arrested he said well arrest me yourself and kindly conduct me to the persons who are over there he pointed to m martelli and abbe chastanier sauvert accompanied him and apologized when he heard he had put his hand on a count and wealthy landlord it only required transportation said m de girousse laughing for my day to be complete he then held a whispered conversation with the shipowner and explained to him the position we saw nothing of all that said m martelli they shut us up in that shop in the company of an individual who looked like a regular villain do you say philippe and marius are hidden in that house there yes and i am very much afraid they have been arrested but the worst of it is that i have left marius's wife and philippe's child in that other house this news completed making the shipowner quite sad abbe chastanier however pointed out that fine and joseph were not running any very great danger if the house were sacked there would always be time to intervene but they must think above all of the two brothers and endeavour to assist them to escape the misfortune was that it seemed almost impossible to do anything to help them in the meanwhile the troops who had invaded the rioters stronghold were not inactive a few shots were still being fired from windows here and there and this had to be put a stop to so the order was given to take by assault all the houses that were closed and on the roofs of which the insurgents were discharging their last cartridges a few sappers were sent forward and these began hacking at the doors with their axes so vert was in despair he wished to lead the soldiers away from the dwelling where he supposed philippe was hidden but he could see no way of doing so he got his men together posted them on the opposite side of the square and set them searching other buildings but unfortunately a shot was fired from the very house he wished to protect a lieutenant was wounded and all the soldiers rushed towards the door the idiots murmured sauvert what need had they to wound that man now my young friend's affair is settled he approached wishing at least to be one of the first to enter the place while these events were occurring metteus and m de casalis were engaged in animated conversation in a corner of the square the spy with his piercing eyes had perceived his master in the midst of a crowd as soon as he got out of the shop when he had taken him aside he said in a jeering tone well don't you congratulate me i have been doing a tremendous lot of work i didn't see you on the barricade answered the deputy of course those simpletons took the precaution of placing me beyond danger of the bullets by shutting me up in a shop and i feel very thankful to them for doing so come victory is on our side where did you take the child to eh hey, you're in too great a hurry i'll hand you the child presently look he is there in that house where they are bursting open the door Mathias then explained to m de casalis what he had done and what there still remained to do he was certain of success however he added we must act promptly 
they imprisoned with me i was unable to understand why two friends of the cayolles look they're still standing on the threshold of our common jail i am afraid that their presence will be to our disadvantage m de casadis looked and recognized m martelli and abbe chastanier he did not see m de girousse who was turning his back to him bah he murmured they're not troubling about us to work matthias i'll double the promised reward if you succeed the sappers had just given the first strokes of the axe which were producing dull thuds on the door and do you know where that villain philippe has got to inquired m de casadis i hope he's been arrested answered matthias in any case he will be caught if he has taken refuge in the house have no anxiety his affair is settled he'll get at least ten years transportation i'd sooner finish with him here i had him at the end of my gun aren't you afraid that if he be in the house he will interfere with your plans bah he's hidden at the bottom of some cupboard look out the door is giving way don't meddle with anything watch me act if it amuses you and as soon as i have the child follow me quickly we'll settle our account later on Mathias left his master in the centre of the square and mixed with the soldiers the axes of the sappers had cut through the woodwork of the door and although the hinges and lock still held good it was on the point of being broken down sauvert had followed this performance with anxiety he had counted on gathering his own men together and entering the house first just as the door began to give way he felt a hand on his arm and turning round recognized his old manager cadet fine's brother the young man dragged him quickly aside and in a choking voice asked what has happened have you seen my sister but before the ex-master stevedore could answer he continued i and my men have been confined to the office since this morning the authorities being aware of my opinions placed a picket of national guards at my door and i have only just been able to escape i ran to my brother-in-law's lodging on the cour bonaparte and found the house empty goodness gracious what has happened speak quick good heavens murmured sauvert a misfortune never comes singly the whole family must be in this house do you think my sister is there hey i don't know what i do know is that i saw philippe on the barricade fighting like a maniac ah my poor cadet i'm very much afraid all this will end very badly but i forgot your enemy is prowling about the square what enemy monsieur de casalis he's disguised as a national guard cadet shuddered all at once he perceived the door had been broken in let's run there quick he exclaimed as soon as the entrance was clear a swarm of soldiers rushed forward but three or four shots were fired from the staircase and the besiegers withdrew in disorder for a few moments no one dared penetrate within the passage the insurgents had spent their last cartridges and after this show of defence had bounded up on the roof to try and escape after the first moment of panic the soldiers made up their minds to advance cautiously to the foot of the staircase then seeing they met with no resistance they invaded the house and searched in every corner sauvert and cadet had committed the imprudence of retiring a short distance away for the purpose of talking and when they endeavoured to approach the door again they found themselves behind a regular crowd which prevented them advancing notwithstanding all their efforts they had to beat time a long while and when they at last entered they were only able to get up the staircase very slowly on account of its being so full of soldiers and national guards as they reached the third floor they were jostled by a man who was running away and knocking up against every one this individual whom the besiegers took for a terrified lodger had a child in his arms he passed so rapidly half hiding his charge beneath his frock coat that cadet did not get a good view of him the young man however turned round as if feeling a presentiment that something was wrong but the man had then already descended five or six stairs fine's brother pushed on by sauvert who had seen nothing continued to ascend and soon found himself at the entrance of the little lodging this door was wide open and in the middle of the first room fine lay unconscious on the ground joseph had disappeared chapter twenty how philippe fired a last shot fine's anguish during the struggle had been terrible each shot had made her tremble for she thought to herself with horror that the bullet had perhaps killed one of hers 
she would have liked to have been below in the street sharing the peril of marius and philippe but the necessity of looking after joseph confined her to that room where she was dying with anxiety the poor child was as white as a sheet and his teeth were set firmly together but he was not crying with his face hidden in the young woman's lap and his little arms clutching her waist he stood motionless and mute on several occasions bullets entered by the window cutting up the furniture and becoming embedded in the wall fine gazed at the holes made by these projectiles with stupor she tried to make herself smaller caught up joseph and clasped him closely in her arms she did not care about herself but an icy shiver ran through her frame when she thought that a bullet might rebound and strike the child she was pressing to her bosom this torment lasted more than an hour she listened with anxiety to the least sound all at once from the tumult that arose from the square she understood that the barricades had been carried she felt relieved but this feeling was soon followed by increased anxiety as the firing had ceased she ventured to approach the window and throw a glance outside suddenly she was seized with the most horrible fear she asked herself why marius and philippe had not come upstairs again after the barricades had been taken they ought to have hurried up there to hide themselves beside her if they had not come it was because they were taken prisoners or perhaps killed her mind which was tormented with the most frightful thoughts would admit of no other solution then it seemed to her that she saw her husband and brother-in-law stretched out weltering in their blood or being led away to prison by the soldiers and these pictures which she conjured up in her terrible grief caused her to burst out sobbing as she was gazing on the square she perceived the troops rushing towards the house she rapidly withdrew from the window and almost immediately heard the blows of the axes joseph began to fret his fright which had hitherto been mute now showed itself in most piercing cries he called his father clung to fine's neck yelled out that he didn't want the soldiers to come and take him the poor child's shrieks had the effect of causing the young woman to completely lose her head she rushed on to the staircase wanted to go down and run to marius and philippe but she had not reached the second floor before she heard the door give way and fall in at the same instant the rioters who were hidden in the corridor hastened upstairs after having discharged their weapons for a moment she hesitated a muffled sound came from the vestibule and she soon heard the footsteps of the besiegers approaching her she remained firm and would perhaps have stayed there if leaning over the banister she had not caught sight of the man who was coming up first that man was matthias she thought herself in presence of the phantom of her despair as if fascinated with her eyes increased in volume with horror she ascended the stairs one by one retreating before matthias who never ceased glaring at her as she entered the room and before she had time to shut herself in he sprang upon her and tore joseph from her arms she uttered a faint cry which was the only defence she could offer for she was broken down with emotion and staggering on her legs when she no longer felt the child in her arms she stretched her hands out before her as if to regain possession of the dear treasure and encountering naught but emptiness fell stiff to the floor none of the soldiers who were searching the house noticed this scene but the abduction had all the same been witnessed by two people in a neighbouring building the house in which marius and philippe had taken refuge by chance stood at the corner of the square on the other side of the grand rue by a happy circumstance the two brothers were the only insurgents who had entered it and as soon as they were inside they had bolted the door the staircase was silent and deserted and the tenants who were barricaded in their respective dwellings took very good care not to show themselves marius and philippe sat down for a moment on the first stair and held counsel they hardly knew how they would be able to escape the search of the soldiers who from one moment to another might burst the door open the only chance remaining to them was to escape by the roofs but this retreat would be very dangerous and besides although the peril of remaining where they were was intense they wished to do so in order to make sure that fine and joseph ran no risk we ought not to have abandoned them said philippe it was cowardly on our part to have thought only of our own personal safety don't let us despair answered marius who had been endeavouring to comfort himself whilst trying to assuage his brother's anxiety we should have perhaps done ourselves needless harm fine is strong and courageous no matter i'll only consent to fly when my mind's easy on their account 
listen they're breaking in a door let us go up quick they ascended to the first floor and saw with the greatest alarm that the house which was being besieged was the one opposite for the space of a few minutes they remained motionless and breathless each stroke of the axe found an echo in their breasts never in their lives had they felt such emotion they followed the different phases of the siege with painful anxiety but their greatest suffering after all was their powerlessness to do anything they could not run to the assistance of those whom they believed in peril but must stay where they were with their hands tied and watch this onslaught of a crowd of furious soldiers all at once philippe uttered a savage cry he had just caught sight of matthias in the first rank of the besiegers and pointed him out to his brother ah oh, the wretch he murmured bitterly i ought to have let them hang him he must have escaped and is there to steal joseph he was turning round when another cry escaped him and he pointed out to marius a national guard half hidden behind one of the trees on the square casalis he exclaimed in a choking tone and bringing his musket to his shoulder he continued i have but one bullet left and it shall be for him he was about to fire but marius tore the gun away from him saying no unnecessary murder we shall perhaps want that bullet it's regular foul play at the same moment the door gave way beneath the blows of the axe let's go up higher continued marius they ascended to the third floor where a terrible sight awaited them exactly opposite was the window of the room where fine and joseph were they saw the young woman wringing her hands but were unable to cry out to her amidst the tumult that they were watching over her and they were thus pale and trembling spectators of the abduction when fine went downstairs they followed her with their eyes each window having a landing looking on to the street then they saw her come up again retreating before matthias the next thing was matthias entering the room and tearing joseph from the young woman's arms marius returned philippe his musket saying to him in a husky voice i felt we should have need of that last cartridge philippe brought the weapon to his shoulder but the barrel shook in his hands he was afraid of hitting his son and so matthias was able to leave the room and commence going downstairs when the villain passed before the window on the second floor landing philippe again felt himself shaking and could not pull the trigger if you let him reach the street murmured marius we shall lose the child then philippe made a violent effort and recovered his customary coolness he rested the barrel on the window and waited for matthias to pass again as the spy who continued to descend placed his foot on the first floor landing the gun went off sauvert and cadet who were attending to fine raised their heads at the report and perceived the two brothers leaning anxiously out of one of the windows on the other side of the street endeavouring to find out the effect of the shot the ex-master stevedore uttered a cry of surprise and satisfaction he now knew the whereabouts of those whom he wished to protect cadet had a sudden presentiment of what had just occurred not having found the child in the room he had at once thought of the man who had dashed past him on the stairs he ran down as fast as he could and found a strange sight awaiting him on the first floor matthias with his head smashed was lying on the landing in falling he had opened his arms and joseph had slipped on to him without doing himself any injury philippe's bullet had lodged in the spy's skull passing close to the child's forehead the latter recovering from the fainting fit which had helped matthias to carry him off easily and resting half on the corpse began to cry bitterly cadet pushed aside the dead body and took the little boy in his arms he had got half-way upstairs again when a sudden thought struck him and going down again he searched the corpse taking all the papers he could find on it these he was sure would be useful when he returned to the room on the third floor he found sauvert very much embarrassed not knowing what remedy to administer to fine who was still unconscious the worthy man had confined himself to placing her on the bed and cadet put joseph beside her the child immediately clasped the young woman round the neck nestling close up to her quite happy at having his favourite place again and brought her back to life with his caresses she raised herself up and kissed joseph passionately it seemed to her that she was awakening from a frightful nightmare all of a sudden she turned pale again where are marius and philippe she inquired hide nothing from me i beg of you when cadet had pointed out the two brothers to her in the adjoining house she remained for a time motionless and quite absorbed with joy 
all danger was not over for them assuredly but they lived and for the moment she did not ask for anything more philippe and marius also had good cause to be thankful the former after having discharged his gun felt quite overcome his eyes were bursting with tears and he uttered a cry of terror on seeing metteus and the child paul for an instant he felt as if he were choking being unable to distinguish through the smoke whether he had struck his son or not but when marius heard the cries of the little one whom cadet had just brought into the room he exclaimed look then the two brothers followed the scene that was passing before them with profound happiness they saw fine and joseph safe and sound and said to each other that they ran little risk themselves now that they had friends at hand to defend them what gave them still further confidence was to see m martelli and abbe chastanier go up into the room conducted there by m de girousse these three gentlemen had followed the soldiers into the house in order to protect the young woman and had no idea of the rapid drama that had just occurred there the sight of the corpse on the staircase had made them run up hurriedly and as soon as they reached the room they heard what had happened from fine and cadet this casalis is a scoundrel exclaimed m de girousse i'll undertake to settle him but before all we must think of how we can shelter marius and philippe from the search of the troops indeed there is no time to lose look he pointed to the square the position of the two brothers was becoming critical the shot fired by philippe had attracted the attention of the troops to the house where they had taken refuge and sappers were already belabouring the door with heavy blows from their axes they have only one chance of safety said m martelli to try and escape by the roofs that's impossible answered cadet excitedly the house is much higher than those adjoining it they're lost fine felt herself going mad with despair again all those in the room were racking their brains in vain and the blows from the axe were becoming more and more violent suddenly m de girousse addressed sauvert whom cadet had presented to him as a friend cannot you make your men stop he inquired eh hey, no exclaimed the captain in despair think you they obey so easily as that in the national guard wait a moment wait a moment sauvert opened his eyes quite wide and it could be seen that some conception was being painfully evolved in his mind all at once he said i have an idea come with me cadet the two men ran rapidly downstairs and m de girousse and the others awaited their return with the most painful concern at length they made their appearance each carrying a bundle of clothes and cadet at once made signs to marius and philippe to open the window behind which they were concealing themselves when they had understood what he meant and conformed to his injunctions the young man at the expense of considerable strength and dexterity threw the two bundles over to them the soldiers being busy below with the door failed to see what was passing above such was the idea that sauvert had conceived accompanied by cadet he had gone to an ambulance where about a dozen wounded national guards were lying and had there quietly stolen two complete uniforms amidst the confusion of amputations and the dressing of wounds philippe and marius had had all the gravity of their position brought home to them and were on the point of deciding to attempt escape by the roofs when they understood that their friends were busying themselves about their safety as soon as they had the uniforms they rushed up into the lofts where they attired themselves as national guards and had barely had time to do so and to throw their own clothes out of a window looking on to a neighbouring courtyard when they heard the front door giving way they at once hid themselves but after a moment or two cleverly mingled with the swarm of besiegers whom they pretended to assist in the search and eventually quietly walked out into the street where they found m de girousse and sauvert awaiting them a short distance further off on the square were cadet and fine with m martelli and abbe chastanier the young woman who was carrying little joseph had expressed the desire to return at once to the lodging on the cour bonaparte as soon as she perceived marius and philippe in the street she moved away looking behind her at every step she had requested m de girousse to follow her with the two brothers philippe and marius warmly shook the ex-master stevedore's hand unable to utter a word of thanks all right all right murmured the worthy man who was very much affected the least one can do is to assist one's friends hang it but we must have order you see before everything the national guard was only formed to preserve order i'm the man for duty and he began to cry out against the national guards who were all in a flutter on the square whilst m de girousse and the two brothers rapidly moved away <laughs> 
as sauveur was trying to get his men together he perceived m de cazalis behind a tree looking pale and anxious he pretended not to see him and watched his movements the ex-deputy could not understand the strange events that were passing around him since Mathieus had disappeared in the house he awaited his return without being able to form any idea of what was occurring when he saw fine appear with little joseph when he perceived that his enemies were miraculously escaping from all his snares he was agitated with sullen rage what added to his anger was his being tortured by the idea that Mathieus had betrayed him what can the scoundrel be doing he murmured he sold himself to the cayeuses and has helped them to escape at last unable to restrain himself any longer he made up his mind to go and see what Mathieus could be doing in that house which he did not leave had he met him he would have strangled him on reaching the first-floor landing he came in contact with his accomplice's corpse livid terrified and with his mouth wide open he stood and stared at it then he abruptly stooped down and searched it when he found the pockets were empty he was in despair and giving the dead man's body an angry kick he hurried rapidly away i knew very well thought sauveur who had not lost sight of him that that bird of ill omen must have had something to do with the abduction of the child the struggle however was over and the troops victorious it was about four o'clock the resistance had been smart but of short duration the principal leaders of the rioters had fled as soon as the barricades were captured but a great many workmen were made prisoners those who were unable to escape by the roofs of the houses where they had taken refuge were discovered in the cellars cupboards under the beds in the chimneys and even in the wells where they had thought they would have been in safety when the houses had been searched the six barricades were removed and the place aux yeux occupied by the military there was a family gathering at marius's apartment in the evening the young couple philippe and joseph had found themselves united again amidst tears of joy and tenderness m de Giroux troubled their happiness by pointing out that it was necessary to make philippe disappear as soon as possible if they did not want to see him dispatched to one of the colonies he offered to take him with him to lambesque on the following day and hide him at one of his houses and this suggestion was gratefully accepted in the meanwhile philippe was to stay with m martelli when he had left m de Giroux had a long conversation with marius about m de cazalis cadet had handed his brother-in-law the papers he had found in the spy's pocket and among them was the letter which the latter had insisted on his master giving him and in which he was guaranteed a sum of money for joseph's abduction this document was a terrible arm henceforth the cayeuses would be able to make blanche's uncle disgorge but marius thought the best thing would be not to claim anything from m de cazalis confining themselves to preserving the letter as a constant threat and so restrain the ex-deputy from taking any steps against philippe a scandal he thought would only reflect on the whole family m de Giroux expressed his warm approbation of this disinterested attitude and undertook to see m de cazalis personally the next day he called on him and had an interview that lasted two hours no one ever knew the tenor of the conversation between the two noblemen but from the loud angry tones that reached the servants hall it is supposed that m de Giroux must have bitterly reproached the former deputy with his unworthy behaviour and have crushed him with the heel of an upright man in order to wring from him the necessary formal promise to desist from further persecution it was thus that the nobility in regard to this matter washed their dirty linen in private when m de Giroux withdrew the servants noticed that their master accompanied him humbly to the door with lips firmly set together and pale cheeks an hour later the old count and philippe were driving along the road to lambesque in a cabriolet End of chapters nineteen and twenty Part three, chapters twenty one, twenty two, and twenty three of the Mysteries of Marseilles by Emile Zola, translated by Ernest Alfred Vizitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty one, the duel. A year after the sanguinary events just related, the shadow of death passed again over Marseilles, and the entire city was touched by it. It was no longer a question of a few dozen wounded; people were struck down by hundreds civil war had been followed by the cholera a history of the numerous and terrible epidemics that have decimated marseilles would be a most painful one 
the position of the city in a warm climate its constant connection with asia the filth of its old streets everything seems to fatally indicate it has a hot bed of infection where contagious diseases spread with frightful rapidity it is threatened as soon as ever summer comes round at the least negligence if by mishap the scourge is allowed to enter the city it never fails to gain all the coastline and from there to spread throughout france the epidemic of eighteen forty nine was relatively benign it broke out about the middle of august and it is stated that it was not serious until a convoy of invalided troops were landed from rome and algiers fifty of these soldiers succumbed it is said on the night following their arrival from that moment the disease had taken firm hold in marseilles amidst the outbursts of political passion at that time the government of the republic was bitterly reproached with a decree dated august tenth which authorized vessels from the levant to enter the port on a simple declaration from the medical man on board this decree suppressing quarantine laid the city open to the germs of the disease the incubation was rather slow by the end of august there were one hundred and ninety-six victims but in the following month the mortality was terrible no less than twelve hundred persons succumbing the epidemic died out in october after nearly five hundred more people had been added to the death list the inhabitants were seized with panic from the very outbreaks of the disease and there was a general stampede the news that the cholera had again visited the city ran from quarter to quarter like a train of gunpowder a man had died in frightful agony and the case was forthwith multiplied old women affirming they had seen more than a hundred burials go by the people spoke in an undertone of poison accusing the wealthy of having infected the water at all the pumps and these statements increased the panic a poor wretch who was drinking at the fountain on the cool was nearly massacred because a workman pretended he had seen him throw something into the water fright produced terrible effect upon the lively imagination of the crowd the inhabitants believed a foul vapour was passing over the city and the women walked about the streets with handkerchief pressed to their lips daring neither to drink nor breathe the marseillaise hardly existed the city was deserted all who could run away did so the country houses in the vicinity were crowded with refugees there were even families who went and camped out as far as the hills of the nerth preferring to live in the open air under a tent to remaining in a place where they encountered death at the corner of every street the wealthy those who had residences outside or could rent them were the first to leave then the employed the workmen the breadwinners who compromised their everyday existence by abandoning the workshops lost courage in the presence of the scourge and a great number of them preferred to fly and run the risk of starving so that marseilles little by little became dismal and empty there remained only men of courage who either resisted the epidemic or regarded it with contempt and the poor wretches who were forced to remain at their posts in spite of their fright if there were acts of cowardice such as the sudden disappearance of doctors and functionaries there were also examples of energy and self-sacrifice offices where assistance could be obtained had been opened in the most severely visited quarters from the commencement and there men devoted themselves day and night to the relief of the crazy population who were dying of fright marius was among the first to offer his services but in presence of the tears of fine and joseph he had to give way and consent to leave marseilles he knew his wife she would have remained at his side and shared the danger and the child would then have run the same risk the thought that fine and joseph might die in his arms had struck marius with terror and he had ran away trembling for the safety of those he loved the family found refuge at a house which they had rented in the st just quarter close to the old country residence of the cayolles it was then the end of august philippe had remained with m de girousse at lambesque for twelve months and during that time had not set foot in marseilles waiting till the days of june were forgotten indeed he was not disturbed inquiries were made about him at first but powerful influence having been exerted on his behalf further search was abandoned as soon as he learned that the young household was in the suburbs of marseilles he bade good-bye to m de girousse and hurried off to see his son he felt weary at lambesque and soon convinced his brother that he would be able to lodge with him without being guilty of the least imprudence the cholera had driven all recollection of the rioting out of people's minds and no one thought of going to arrest him at a long league from marseilles a delightful existence commenced while the disease was ravaging and striking terror in the city the inmates of the little country house in the st just quarter were enjoying happy hours and charming tranquillity they drifted into egotism in spite of themselves 
after the terrible blows they had received they bathed in happiness it was their turn not to suffer they went out but little finding the little enclosure surrounding the house quite large enough for fresh air and exercise a fortnight passed very peacefully then one morning philippe who had been dreaming all night of the past announced that he was going for a walk he went out in the direction of the mill of st joseph following the road he had often passed along before to meet blanche when he came to the little pine wood behind the country house he thought of that day in may that afternoon of folly which had thrown blanche into his arms and been the misfortune of his existence that souvenir was both sweet and bitter he recalled his youth his mad burning passion and at the same time the tears and grief of the only woman he had ever loved two great tears rolled down his cheeks without his feeling them as he wiped them away and gazed around him seeking for the spot where blanche had sat by his side he all of a sudden perceived m de casalis standing motionless in the centre of a path with his terrible eyes fixed upon him the ex-deputy had been among the first to leave marseilles he had taken refuge at his country residence in the st joseph quarter where he was living alone and was quite ferocious with suppressed irritation since his interview with m de girousse he had fallen into a state of despondency which was broken at distant intervals by frightful outbursts of passion although a year had passed he still heard the old count's words of indignation and contempt tinkling in his ears these words were choking him and he would fain have relieved himself by wreaking vengeance on some one understanding that it would be impossible to pick a quarrel with m de girousse he ardently desired to find himself face to face with philippe so to end the matter one way or another either killing his enemy or being killed by him he thought no more about the money he had lost his appetite for luxury and power since he had heard that the cayolles abandoned all claim to his niece's fortune it became a matter of indifference to him he now had but one great desire at heart to wash away m de girousse's expressions of contempt with the blood of an enemy and lo all at once he met philippe at a deserted spot in the middle of this wood which belonged to him he had gone out his head bent down seeking a means to attain his end and chance placed him face to face with the very person he wished to meet to satisfy his vengeance the two men stared for a moment at each other in silence they had both stooped as if to be ready to spring at each other's throats then each felt ashamed at finding himself in the attitude of a wild animal when they wished to act toward one another as civilized animals i have been seeking you for a year said m de casalis at last you are in my way and i'm in yours one of us must disappear i'm quite of your opinion answered philippe i have weapons in that house wait for me in a few seconds i'll be with you no we cannot fight so if i were to kill you they would accuse me of murdering you we must have witnesses and where shall we find them in a couple of hours both of us can go to marseilles and be back again with two of our friends good the meeting is for noon at the same spot yes at the same spot they had spoken in a stern voice and without the least insult the provocation was natural as if it were a matter agreed upon long before philippe went immediately to marseilles resolving to keep his brother in ignorance of what was about to occur for he felt the encounter necessary and would not run the risk of an obstacle being placed in the way of it as he was going down the cour he met sauvert tearing along don't stop me said the ex-master stevedore to him i'm returning to the aigalades in great haste the men are falling like flies here there were eighty deaths yesterday philippe without listening to him told him he had a duel on hand and relied on him when he had named his adversary sauvert exclaimed i'm your man and i would not be sorry to see that scoundrel's brains blown out they called together on m martelli whose courageous behaviour was causing universal admiration in marseilles the shipowner listened to philippe gravely and thought as he did that the duel was necessary and inevitable i am at your disposal he answered simply the three men took a cab and at a little before noon entered the pine wood where they had to wait for m de casalis at length he arrived after having ran through marseilles in search of a couple of friends in vain he had made up his mind to go to the barracks where two obliging sergeants consented to act as witnesses as soon as the cab that brought them had been sent to stand near that of philippe the paces were counted and the weapons loaded rapidly and in silence and without any attempt being made at reconciliation 
never before had preparations for a duel been more prompt or simple when the principals had been placed face to face philippe whom fortune had favoured raised his arm ready to fire but he all at once felt a presentiment and shuddered before m de cazalis had arrived he had been looking in a melancholy way at the pines which surrounded him and beneath which he had courted in days gone by chance is at times cruel the scenery was the same the vast heavens expanded with the same limpidity the country displayed an horizon as soft and peaceful when philippe raised his pistol he thought he remembered that he was on the very spot where blanche had given him her first kiss and that remembrance caused him singular trouble he fancied he heard his heart murmur where i have sinned there shall i be punished he pressed the trigger with a trembling hand the bullet badly aimed sped and broke a branch of one of the pines m de cazalis in his turn raised his weapon he aimed with contracted features and flaming eyes sauvert and martelli looking very pale waited philippe with his body slightly sideways looked courageously at the pistol threatening him but in truth he did not see it he was thinking in spite of himself of blanche and he heard all his being crying louder than before where i have sinned there shall i be punished the pistol went off philippe fell m martelli and sauvert ran up to him he had sunk down on the grass with his hand to his right side you are touched inquired the ex-master stevedore in an unsteady voice i am killed murmured philippe this spot was bound to be fatal to me and he fainted the two witnesses consulted together for an instant whilst staunching his wound in their haste they had not thought of bringing a doctor with them it was imperative to transport the wounded man to marseilles as rapidly as possible listen said m martelli we'll put him in a cab and i'll take him to the hospital for he'll be more promptly attended to there than anywhere else in the meanwhile you run and tell his brother act so that the young woman and child do not suspect anything both were deeply affected it seemed that they were losing one of theirs sauvert ran off towards st just while m martelli assisted by the sergeants carried philippe to the vehicle m de cazalis had retired acting the indifferent but with his heart bounding with intense delight the shipowner instructed the driver to go slowly for nearly an hour that the sad journey lasted he supported the unconscious wounded man's pale vacillating head he had placed his handkerchief to the wound to stop the blood but he saw the patient so weak that he feared that he would never be able to get him to the hospital alive they arrived at last when m martelli stated that he brought a wounded man he was answered rather abruptly that all the wards were full at length philippe was received only there was no room and he was taken into a cholera ward the doctor who had seen him on his admission shaking his head and saying they could put him anywhere as he was beyond all danger from the disease m martelli accompanied him for he would not go away until marius arrived the ward into which he entered had a sinister look and extended in the dim light to a considerable length the two rows of white beds were set against the walls like tombs and on them one could perceive the rigidness of the bodies in the furious agony of death patients afflicted with the disease yelled and distorted themselves in this long cold room sisters of mercy slim delicate women moved softly round the beds assisting the doctors in their work m martelli had seated himself near the mattress on which philippe had been placed face to face with death and watched the sisters of mercy who were quietly and compassionately attending to the dying he noticed one a short distance away from him who was comforting with her tender words the last moments of an old man the face of this patient although contracted in the death agony did not seem unknown to him he drew near and recognized with pain that it was abbe chastanier the priest was dying a victim to his consummate charity since the commencement of the epidemic he had not taken an hour's repose day and night he ascended to the garrets visiting poor families struck down by the disease he had parted with all he possessed to give help to the unfortunate and when he had nothing left but the clothes he wore he had gone begging to the rich as he was leaving a house in the old town that morning he had been struck down with a violent attack of cholera in the street and hurried off to the hospital where for the last two hours he had been enduring the most atrocious agony with exemplary fortitude when m martelli approached him his eyes were already covered with a film and he was unable to see the ground but he nevertheless recognized the shipowner he smiled but he could not utter a single word 
then raising a hand he pointed to heaven after he was dead m martelli gazed at him for a moment and then returned to seat himself beside philippe who continued as rigid as a corpse just then the young sister of mercy who had knelt for an instant beside abbe chastanier's body came forward to see if she could not render the wounded man some assistance she had hardly glanced at philippe's face when all her features were distorted with emotion with her eyes fixed on the young man and her breast heaving she stood there lost in painful contemplation at that moment marius entered the room followed by sauvaire seeing his brother extended stiff and livid he sobbed aloud the news of the duel and philippe's wound had come upon him so abruptly that he was quite stupid as soon as he was face to face with the wounded man he asked violently for a physician and insisted on the patient being saved the doctor who was in the ward touched by this outburst of grief consented to sound the wound again marius felt a burn in his inside when his brother uttered a plaintive cry on feeling the touch of the instrument that cry made the young sister of mercy shudder as she came forward marius caught sight of her you here he murmured angrily ah i ought to have expected you would be present at the last moments of the man whom your love brought to misfortune you are the worthy niece of your uncle who has just killed my brother the young sister of mercy had joined her hands she looked humbly and beseechingly at marius half choked by anguish and unable to reply pardon me continued the young man immediately i know not what i do do not remain there philippe might see you on opening his eyes we must avoid causing him violent emotion is it not so he spoke as a child wandering in his mind when he had recognized blanche in the costume of the sisters of st vincent paul he really thought he saw a phantom rise up before him she reminded him of a whole past full of suffering at the outbreak of the epidemic blanche had begged as a favor to be allowed to work in the hospital at marseilles perhaps she hoped to die there her devotedness was the admiration of all she lived in the midst of death with the courage and abnegation of a martyr to have seen her bending over the frightful features of the dying no one would have guessed that her childhood had been so weak and delicate and her birth so illustrious on several occasions they wanted to send her away telling her she had discharged her tribute but she had obtained permission to remain by beseeching the authorities to allow her to do so for a month she had been defying death and death had respected her abbe chastanier's last agony and the sight of philippe lying inanimate before her had just given her a shock that broke her courage she was staggering and all her human feelings had returned to her she retreated a few steps obedient to marius's gesture while the doctor completed the dressing of the wound philippe at last opened his eyes and looked round about him with an expression of lively astonishment but on seeing his brother he remembered all marius mastering his tears with a violent effort bent over him i don't see joseph philippe said to him in a voice as faint as one's breath where is he he is coming answered marius immediately is it not so i want to see him immediately immediately he closed his eyes again marius had told a falsehood he had run off without telling fine and joseph what had happened in the desire of delaying their despair for at least a few hours but now in face of his brother's request he would have given all he possessed in this world to have brought the child with him shall i go and fetch the little one asked sauvaire who felt extremely uneasy amidst all these cholera patients and yet dared not run away marius accepted the offer at once and the ex-master stevedore ran off immediately philippe had no doubt heard what had been said for he reopened his eyes and thanked his brother with a look as he turned his head his face became overspread with a look of happy ecstasy he had just perceived blanche who had drawn near on hearing the sound of his voice am i dead he murmured oh dear tender vision and he fainted again chapter twenty two the punishment when the vehicle carrying away philippe had gone some distance from the scene of the encounter m de cazalis warmly thanked the sergeants who had assisted him as witnesses gentlemen he said to them excuse the trouble i have given you and kindly allow me to drive you back to marseilles the sergeants made some difficulty saying that they could very well return to town alone but m de cazalis insisted the truth being that he wanted to know if philippe was really dead for he dared not rejoice until his enemy had been nailed down in his coffin 
as the cab in which the ex-deputy and his two witnesses were seated was coming out of the rue d'aix it was stopped by the solemn procession conducting the statue of notre dame de la garde back to her church this virgin is the guardian saint of marseilles and when a misfortune overshadows the city the inhabitants carry it along their streets prostrating themselves before it and beseeching the virgin to implore the clemency of the almighty on their behalf m de cazalis was irritated at this obstruction for he was kept waiting for a long quarter of an hour whilst dying of impatience to get news of philippe and at the bottom of his heart wished the procession to the deuce but at the very minute when the statue of the virgin passed before him he all at once felt a mortal shiver which descended into his very bowels he leant on the shoulder of one of the sergeants growing paler and paler and suddenly sank all of a heap to the bottom of the vehicle uttering plaintive moans he had been brought down by a violent attack of the prevalent disease he had escaped the hand of philippe and it was the cholera that had undertaken his punishment the two sergeants had sprang from the cab and the crowd who soon ascertained that they were in the presence of a cholera patient fled from the vehicle aghast drive him at once to the hospital cried one of the sergeants to the coachman the man whipped up his horse and the cab entering the old town which the procession had just left was in a few minutes before the hospital where two attendants carried m de cazalis into the cholera ward only one empty bed remained and he was placed beside philippe when the ex-deputy who was already turning black was brought in marius and m martelli who recognized him had stepped back affrighted but m de cazalis did not immediately notice what neighbor's chance had given him the disease was racking him most terribly he was lost in one of his convulsions he raised himself and at last perceived philippe who was extended on the adjoining bed still unconscious then he reflected that he was dying himself and would not have enough life to enjoy his vengeance and at that thought he fell back on his bed literally howling with rage save me he shouted out i want to live oh i am wealthy i will reward you and he distorted himself in the most frightful suffering exclaiming that they were tearing out his entrails philippe in the meanwhile had opened his eyes the hoarse voice of his enemy had momentarily drawn him from the lethargy that was gaining possession of him and raising his head he stared at m de cazalis as if in a trance when the latter saw the wounded man resuscitated and looking at him dreamily his rage and terror increased he is not dead he yelled ah the wretch will live and i'm dying they contemplated each other hatred brought them together even in death suddenly they heard a celestial voice exclaim amidst the silence give each other the hand i insist on it one must not go into eternity in anger they raised their heads and perceived blanche beside them standing erect in her grey gown she seemed taller philippe joined his hands without speaking he thought himself already on the other side where he had often dreamed of finding his sweetheart his dream continued m de cazalis clenched his teeth when he heard these words of peace the sight of his niece exasperated him who brought you here he cried you knew i was going to die and you came to enjoy the sight of my death listen continued blanche the almighty is going to judge you do not appear before him with a soul black with hatred for pity's sake give philippe your hand no a thousand times no i would sooner be damned than reconciled to him when i held him at the end of my pistol barrel i knew he would die don't think you'll save him and take him back for a lover he blasphemed shook his fist at heaven vomited foul words upon his niece and philippe but the disease was gaining possession of him he felt himself already turning cold and the horror of his end made him like a mad animal that was powerless to bite blanche had drawn back she leant against the bed of the wounded man who continued gazing at her with great tenderness and bending towards him she said in a gentle tone will you offer that man your hand philippe smiled yes he said i forgive him and would like him to forgive me also i want to live with you in heaven tell me will you not pray to your god to admit me to your paradise blanche very much affected took the dying man's hand which she felt trembling in hers give me yours she said to m de cazalis no never never shouted the cholera patient amidst a convulsion i don't want to live with you in your heaven 
i prefer all the flames of hell go never never he had clasped his hands together and was wildly distorting his arms as he bellowed never never he was seized with a spasm and expired his body remained in its frightful position blanche had turned away her head in horror when she looked down on philippe again she saw that he also was dying he gently pressed her hand his eyes had become clear his lips wore a faint smile he imagined he had been dead a long time and thought no more of his brother who was there or of his son whom he had been inquiring for tell me he murmured without making the least struggle against death you will take me with you won't you and he died at that very moment fine and joseph entered the room marius closed his brother's eyes fine in despair went and knelt down the poor little child standing alone at the foot of the bed was unable to understand and quietly sobbed since joseph had entered the room blanche had been gazing at him in bewilderment all at once she saw he was in danger she kissed philippe's hand which she had retained in hers and then abruptly caught the child up in her arms and ran off with him Monsieur de martelli had to lead marius and fine away but as marius was about to retire he heard one of the dying calling to him don't you remember me a woman asked have you forgotten the wretched armande i had vowed not to see you until i had obtained my pardon i made myself a servant in this hospital and am dying will you give me your hand marius grasped the poor creature's hand and it was only then that he discovered where he was overcome by grief he had not looked round about him before the cholera ward now appeared to him in all its horror m martelli pointed out the corpse of abbe chastanier and from that moment he seemed to see death standing erect in the centre of the room with his immense arms extended thrusting fine before him he went out staggering with giddiness it was not until they were on the staircase that they perceived joseph had disappeared they called him inquired for him searched for him in every corner at length he was discovered at the bottom of an inner courtyard a sister of mercy of the order of st vincent paul was holding him in her arms and passionately kissing him the following day marius while returning from his brother's funeral learnt that sister blanche had been carried off by an attack of cholera during the night chapter twenty three epilogue ten years have passed m martelli has retired to a villa he had built on the rocks of andoum and resides there with his sister the only thing that makes him feel sad is to see that liberty is a plant that does not thrive in france he feels sure he will die before the advent of democracy marius has succeeded him at the house of business in the rue de la Dasse. thanks to the fortune joseph came into at the death of his mother and m de casalis he has been able to extend his operations considerably and the shipowners cayolle are now one of the principal firms in marseilles the family has grown older amidst the love and happiness it had waited for so long fine spreads her gay and tender serenity around her and her brother cadet is one of the most active partners in the house joseph is now a tall youth of nineteen possessing the delicate beauty of blanche with philippe's passionate energy he has just completed his studies and expects to work with his uncle who has had the care of his fortune sometimes when the family is assembled of an evening they talk over the past and those dear phantoms blanche and philippe are brought back to life but the tears that are then shed have no bitterness about them peace has come and recollections savour of the sweetness of a sad and far-off song joseph goes every year to Nambest to open the shooting season with m de Girousse. the count is very old but he still possesses the lively and original mind of his youth besides time does not hang heavily on his hands for he has started a large factory ah he often says to the young man if you only heard what the nobility of the department say about me i am a jacobite i have made a misalliance by espousing industry i really regret not having been born a workman for if i had been i should not have passed fifty years of my life dragging out a weary and useless existence in this corner of france but joseph's great friend is the worthy sauvaire the former master stevedore a prey to rheumatism has nevertheless preserved his triumphant manner on sunny days he still displays his vanity on the canebiere and honestly believes that all the girls he meets suddenly fall in love with him 
joseph seems to him too serious look here he says to him leaning on his arm one must amuse oneself in this world in my time we used to laugh from morn till eve ah oh, by jove what fun i had all the pretty women in the city were under my protection you ask your uncle remind him of clairon what a lot of money that girl cost me and then in a lower tone he adds the following phrase which he delights in repeating it was the priests who took her from me end of chapters twenty one twenty two and twenty three end of the mysteries of marseilles by emile zola recorded by celine major